A jazzy. Yeah, I got jazzy music. Hello and welcome everyone to PerfWeb 76 Day 2. I'm your host, Joe Basha, uh, and uh, I'm uh, here with my my wonderful friend and colleague and incredibly talented and fortunate retired, semi-retired, mostly <laughs> retired perfusion <laughs> colleague, Mike Brown. Mike, it's good to see you again. Good to Thanks be here. Thanks for coming in here and doing this with me. Um, so uh, real quickly, I do want to mention a couple of quick things. Um, Mike is semi-retired. I mean, that's actually, that wasn't part of the opening remarks, <laughs> but we'll talk about it anyway. We had your retirement party not, not long ago. It was a great party. It I had, was. I had a lot of, I, it was a bittersweet moment for me. <laughs> we keep telling him, right? I told him in fact, today, when I saw him, you're coming out of retirement because, uh, <laughs> you take one, you take one step forward and it, it's used to be two step forward and one step back. Now today, it seems like it's one step forward and two steps back yeah. because they're kicking and harder and harder as you go down this mm -hmm. road i'll tell you what i'm getting older and older and less and less uh patient with things yes mm -hmm. so so to speak so anyway if you want to reach out to us if you have any questions today you have contact at perfusioneducation.com that's a you know emails we answer all of our emails so Please email us if you have any questions or you'd like to be part of the show or programming or uh, whatever the case may be. You just have any questions, you just want to communicate with us, you want to have whatever. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. But reach out to us there, contact at perfusioneducation.com. We're going to turn the phone lines on now because you may have some questions. I'm not doing the YouTube chat today because I'm going to be up mostly messing with that thing. But we have our phone on. Here it is. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a toll free number, but it's, uh, if you have a cell phone, it, I think, and I don't know, how can they do it on uh, uh, magic if they're, if they're out of the country? Like, is there a way to do it where it doesn't cost the money? Uh, Skype call. They can Skype call. Yeah. So you can Skype to that number. Uh, you can. They can yeah. Skype call to that number. Okay. So you can Skype call to that number. Um, you could do that. So what, what else did I want to discuss? David, do you remember? I think that's it. That's it. Okay. So let's move on to the show. So the point of this show today, Mike, and to our viewers out there is, uh, oh yeah, I remember I don't have the YouTube chat, but Magic does. So you can chat your question and then Magic can ask it if you don't want to call in. But I'd, I'd suggest calling in and being live on the air. But as you know, um, when we're in the critical care unit with our patients on ECMO, very frequently we are needing to do some kind of, we'll call it CRRT for the sake of the discussion today and for simplicity, continuous renal replacement therapy. But in reality, it does a, kind of a lot more than does dialysis, we'll say. You can use it. Of course, the kidney is responsible for, you know, metabolic and, and, and electrolyte maintenance and it's responsible for a lot of things and fluid uh, management and all that kind of thing so no question that it is a pseudo quasi kidney device mm -hmm. but it's really used in so many different ways and for so many different purposes even if the patient is making urine and so we, we see it very frequently of course if you have a patient with aki it's where we mostly see it I don't want to get into the, the to the weeds about how CRRT is used. I don't think it's used to its full capacity or capabilities, but I think that in the in the in the in the framework of what we're talking about today, you have a patient on ECMO, they're having an acute kidney injury presentation, uh, fluid retention, electrolyte disturbances, metabolic derangements, acid base derangements. They're going to go on CRRT, right? Right, and most of the time, the last thing you want to do with a patient on ECMO, even under circumstances where, for example, we use limited to no anticoagulation, but that's not for everybody, right? And we, we do certainly see, I think, that the no anticoagulation strategy was beneficial, but it has its downside as well. I don't know what the best way to do this is, and I think all of that's going to have to be vetted out 
over time. However, the last thing you want to do is put another line in this yeah, patient. That's right. That's right. So they want us to integrate it into our ECMO circuit. Right. So how do you do that? And before you really know how to do it, you have to consider, I think, several things. One, the CRRT device is going to have its own uh, native circulation and its own native normal pressures, what would be expected, and that's how it's designed to go into a temporary dialysis catheter. The ECMO circuit is going to have its own circulation and its own pressures, much in the same way the patient would, with the exception of the ECMO circuit is comparative to normal human physiology, a very hostile environment pressure-wise, right. and that can very frequently disrupt and make very difficult and even potentially ineffective um, your CRRT therapeutic, uh, 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 you know, your therapeutic value. So if you understand how it works and what to look for and how to adjust for it to make it work, then you're going to have a much more effective therapy with the CRRT and a much safer um, uh, uh, course with your ECMO as well. Because anytime you add something to an ECMO circuit, anytime you add more things to it, there's increased risk. Right. And so the more things like this that you do, the more you need very highly trained, experienced people at the bedside versus let's say a standard VV ECMO on a patient who's paralyzed, not being prone and is on cruise control, you know, a safe bet that your nurse at the bedside can manage that patient pretty effectively. So long as you have a perfusionist that could get there, you know, in the event of a problem in a reasonable period of time, you know, that's that the risk, the risk ratio on that is very low. Much lower. You have a patient who is, hemodynamically unstable on a lot of drips, not paralyzed, um, and on CRRT, risk has gone up exponentially. It's not a linear, just a little bit more risk. It's a whole lot more risk. So with that said, I'll give you two choices. You can either, so we've got a camera for those of you who are coming in. You want to go ahead and throw up everything we're going to show today? So let's do that and I can explain it. So in the top left corner, you see the ECMO flow controller. On the uh, left bottom, you see the uh, pressures and the uh, battery of the ECMO circuit. So the return pressure and the access pressure, the access of course being negative, the return being positive. Then uh, in the center, you see the full CRRT machine, in which case, uh, when we go through the circuit, we'll zero in or zoom in, we'll say, on the monitor so you can see the pressures very, very well. The top right, you see the uh, overview of the uh, ECMO circuit. And then, um, is that what we're looking at, the overview? Or what, what is camera th uh, I can't tell the top right. Oh, that's uh, I can't tell what that's looking at because there's two, right two where, you'll be where I'll be standing. Okay, so that'll be me standing there. And then, Mike, you have a choice you can stay here or you can join me over there. It's kind of up to you what you'd like to do. I'll join you over there in case you'll join me over there. Okay, so magic can sort of adjust the cameras yeah. and uh, and adjust that. Okay, so let's go play with this device. And that way you have any questions, you can bring them up to me. So there, that's a perfect spot. So I'll stand on this side, you can stand on that side. Or actually, let me, uh, why don't we do this? So David, uh, 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 Mike, since you're there, why don't you starting from, let's say this location, this is the axis is our blue line, this is our return line. Why don't you go through the ECMO circuit as you know it to be and, uh, and point out this recirc line 
which I put in, which is going to uh, access for the CRRT machine and return for the CRRT machine is going to be here. But let's just go ahead and start with the basic circuit first. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, go full screen on that. One thing Joe uh, didn't mention that I want to add <clears throat> is that... Now uh, your camera's to the left there. The, the there difference you between... You want this pointer? No, I, I, I'll okay. just use a tubing clamp. A uh, difference between a patient on CRRT with a VV ECMO as opposed to VA also adds a few different uh, uh, situations here that we'll talk about a little bit later on. But there is Absolutely. a difference. Absolutely. Uh, basically, as we're going here, we're going to consider this to be our patient. As things come down, whatever type of venous cannula you have, uh, femoral, uh, something up in the juggler, if you're doing VV, femoral, basically if you're doing VA, the blood return obviously comes from the patient here and under the negative pressure that Joe was ta talking to you about, and you can see that on Joe's screen. It'll come in here into our uh, inlet of the centrifugal pump head, doing its spin, and liters per minute flow out, which this part now becomes positive, which will be a big portion of considerations with CRRT, becomes positive, goes into the inlet of the oxygenator, does its thing there, as we all know, for our many, many years of work, and then comes out the arterial line and goes to our cannulas back to the patient. Of potential or uh, significant notice is this bypass line which is standard on the, on the top. It uh, used not only as a use for priming, but it's become an adjuvant when we use uh, CRRT to provide flow into the CRRT machine. The way Joe's got this hooked up here is we're just providing another loop here coming down from a positive side on the oxygenator and then back into a pigtail and uh, stopcock situation on the venous line for our CRRT circuit capabilities there. Now, Mike, while you're there, and for the for the benefit of our 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 watch our viewers, take this cap off right here. Mm -hmm. And so, um, if you turn this stopcock that way, which turns it off to this direction, open to here, what's going to happen? you're going to have a bloodbath because you're going to, this, since this is under positive pressure, mm -hmm. you're going to have the flow from the centrifugal head, putting pressure in the oxygenator. This opened up and you will squirt blood all up, all over the place. On right. That and that is, that's messy. You do it, you do it one time. And you know, if and you're you standing learn. right there, you just get, you get, a blood shower, but you turn it off and you're going to be okay. Right. Right. You're probably not going to lose a whole lot of blood because you're going to see it pretty quick unless it does it. And you're not noticing it, which can happen. Right? right. So every time you add these stopcocks, they're, they're treacherous areas, but just for the sake of our folks, our pressure in the line right now is 113 millimeters of mercury. The ECMO is flowing at four liters per minute. Now, what I want you to do, Mike, mm -hmm. is because that, Generally, if you do it, it's not so bad. But what I want you to do is, I want you to turn this stopcock towards the oxygenator as if somebody made a mistake and opened this up to air. So people online can see just how quickly things can fall apart. Now, can you go to, can you put the full screen on for there for just one second? I wanna show you something. I want you to look right here. I'm flowing four liters a minute, okay? You see it right there? All right. So go ahead back to the full screen with Mike. And then as soon as this, th I'll tell you when, go back to that so people can see what the flow is. Go ahead and turn that. And I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a, a, a five second count. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go right ahead. Oh, I have a one way valve in it. Ha! <laughs> ha! No, here, it won't work. Oh, no, I have a clamp there. One. <laughs> Sorry. Two. Three. Okay, go to the full screen. You notice the flow is dropping dramatically. Now go back to the full screen and see this? Look at that. That's oh, you good. Close that now. That is what happens when you are not paying attention to what's going on. And this air 
that would be very problematic for, for, for obvious reasons. Okay, so let's go ahead and de-air the system. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this off for just a second. You got that clamped. All right. And we'll get most of the air out. But for those of you at home, recognize that this would be uh, what you would have to do with a patient connected to it but you would have to somehow get that air out of the circuit before it got to the patient. And the point of me showing you that exercise we'll that is you, that any time you are messing with the ECMO, adding things to it or whatever the case may be, you have to remain diligent and you have to remember, look at all that foam in the oxygen there. Can you show that? Now, this is not on the patient side, but you see it all collecting right there. And I'll get back up to four liters. Okay, so let's go to the flows and the pressures on the ECMO. So go to the full. Yeah, there it is. There's everything. Am I, what am I in the way of? I'm in the way of something. I'm standing in a bad spot. Okay. Let me go over here. Okay, so you see here our flow is at four liters. Let's see, where is it? There you go, 4.2 liters. You see that our pressure in the access is 125. Our pressure in the return is 120 millimeters of mercury. Now, let's come over here and focus on the CRRT machine. So the CRRT machine circuit, this is our simulated patient and I just have a, a, a Y connector hooked up to it. In dialysis and in CRRT, Mike, it's very important to remember, red is your access and blue is your return. Exactly the opposite of what it is for ECMO. 180 degree opposite, okay? But there's a reason why that is. Do you know what the reason is? Do you know why in dialysis, the access is red and the return is blue? I think it is just just for make sure that they're getting the lines hooked up in the right spot. Nope. Nope. Uh -huh. There's actually a reason. So for ECMO and for cardiac pulmonary bypass, access is blue, return is red, right? Mm -hmm. Because it goes through the oxygenator, right? Right. So there's a distinct color change. The color change is from blue blood to red blood. That's what we do for a living, right? We right. turn blue blood red. So that's the reason. In dialysis, if you ever noticed blood going through a hemoconcentrator, how it always looks darker when it's been concentrated. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why the access is red and the return is blue because concentra hemoconcentrated blood appears darker. Okay because it has a higher, hem higher hematocrit, a higher hemoglobin. I did not know that. There's the reason. <laughs> I knew there had to be a reason. So you have your access, which is red, which comes down this line into this uh, di uh, uh, diaphragmatic pressure monitor, goes through the roller pump, which is turning clockwise. So this is a negative pressure side. This is a positive displacement or roller pump. Everything on this side of this pump is negative. Everything on this side and forward of this pump will be positive. And it is occlusive. So if you clamp the line, it'll keep turning and turning and turning. And the pressure, either the pressure limiter stops it or the, the, the tubing could rupture, you, it, whatever. But in this case, it has pressure limiters. Just, it has to be past this point. So here you have another pressure module. You have it coming into the hemoconcentrator or the dialyzer, whichever you prefer. Goes out into a deaeration chamber. This deaeration chamber is hooked up to this pressure, which is your return pressure, and it goes through an air bubble sensor, a brake, and then it eventually goes back to your patient via Marherker. Very important to understand. This is your, remember, a negative pressure. This is your access pressure. 
Here is your access pressures reading minus 10. Can we, uh, I don't know if we can zoom in on this now. So let's go, yeah, that's it. That's a good spot. Maybe come in a little bit. I wanna kinda show these, these, uh, these, this right here where I'm tapping and there. Go down a little bit and zoom in. Down a little bit more and zoom in. How does that look? Can you read those numbers? It's kind of tough. Okay, well, we'll zoom in on them here in a second. So this is your access pressure, which is currently minus 10. This right by it, just past the pump, is your filter pressure. It's the next one down. This is measuring the pressure through the filter plus whatever pressure is in this line. And why that's important is if I block the filter off at any point, including all the way back to the patient, that filter pressure will go up. The differentiator for it, however, is this pressure up here. This is your post filter pressure or return pressure. If the filter is getting clogged or I clamp the line here before this deaeration chamber, then this pressure will go up but this pressure would go down because there would be a restriction in flow. And we all know that pressure equals flow times resistance, right? We all remember that. Um, so with all of that said, this is your effluent pressure. Your effluent pressure is measuring the pressure on the outside of these fibers that you see. Can you zoom in and really show these little hollow fibers that you see. Yeah, that's a beautiful picture right there. So you can see them. Those are all little straws. The blood is on the inside. Outside of that where the housing is, is going to be your effluent pressure, which is measured here in this uh, 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 pressure monitor right here. Then it goes into a waste bag. Now, everything has a pump. You have fluid replacements, you have all these other pumps, but we're really here to focus on these pressures. Right now, the way it's set up, go ahead and zero in on those pressures and this, this whole section right here, if you would. There you go. So if I leave everything as is, but turn out a little bit and to the left, just a hair. Yeah, there you go. And turn my blood flow up. Mike, what pressures will be changed? Your, uh, if you turn it up with a, with a good uh, flowing filter, both of them will, should increase. Right, your access pressure will go up right. because I'm pulling harder through the same diameter line. Right. My filter pressure will go up because there's going to be more flow going through it, plus the return pressure, which again is a fixed, both are fixed diameters. So more flow in a fixed space is going to result in higher pressures on both sides. Now, if you notice the effluent pressure and the return pressure in this configuration is essentially equal. It's essentially equal because I'm not removing any fluid from this patient. I'm not adding any fluid to this patient. This is nothing but the blood circuit going around in circles at this point in time. So let's do it. We're reading minus, it's vacillating between minus six and minus 10, minus 23 on occasion. Is my flow okay on the ECMO? Yeah, everything's working good there. So you see that pressure's vacillating a little bit. And some of that could be the occlusiveness of the pump head, right? It's vacillating, but it's around minus 10. Filter's 132 and return is 96. So now I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna increase the blood flow from 250 to 450. And let's watch and see what happens. Immediately, you see your access pressure has become more negative because you're pulling harder. Your filter pressure has become much more positive. Your return pressure has become much oh, more positive, but so has your effluent pressure because your effluent pressure is a reflection of two things, very important concepts to understand. One is the pressure on the blood phase, and the second is the openness of 
the micro pores of the hollow fibers themselves. So as it become, if it's not occluded at all, since this has no blood in it, all it has is crystalloid in it, every one of those pores of the hollow fibers is wide open. <laughs> Once it has blood in it, those start to become clogged and you have a lower surface area, that effluent pressure will become more and more negative in comparison to your filter pressure or your return pressure. Right. Mm -hmm. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so at this point in time, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn my blood flow back down to a little bit lower. Let's say, I'll bet, I'll bet people I'm gonna do 300. I bet everybody would love to have 450 mLs of blood flow in their CRT circuit with a temporary dialysis catheter. Never happens, but I tell you what, it does make all the difference in the world. It really helps when you have that much blood flow mm -hmm. because you can overflow it, but most of the times we very much underflow it and it's not as effective as it could be. But that's a different topic for a different day in terms of techniques. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start removing fluid from the patient. When I do that, the only pressure that really should change significantly should be the effluent pressure. Agreed? Because now I'm gonna have a roller pump spinning, allowing for blood to come out of the filter, the, the hollow fibers, and into the waste bag. So let's see what happens. So I'm gonna adjust. I'm gonna put patient fluid removal, and I'm gonna turn it up to about, for dramatic purposes, 1,000 mLs an hour, 1,480 an hour. And um, do, do you remember what the number was? Oh heck, let me clear out of that. Hold on. Let me let me let me get back out of there. Um yeah, I messed up. I'm sorry. Clear. Confirm. Okay, go back. Oh, effluent was was 134. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Sorry about that. Oh. Patient fluid removal. 134, right? So there you go, 1480. Now let's watch it. It's going to start turning. Now look at your effluent pressure. Immediately it's come down. Why? Zoom out just a little bit because now this pump is turning right here. Now this pump is your effluent pump. It's not pulling the water out of the hollow fiber and putting it into the waste bag. What it's doing is because the, fil the effluent pressure is still positive. What it's doing is controlling how much. Right. If you just unoccluded this pump, it would there. free flow <laughs> across. Exactly. Right. So you need that pump there so that you can control the amount and speed in which fluid is removed the patient. Where it becomes a problem, I'm going to show everyone how this happens, is when that effluent pressure becomes negative. Then you have a problem because now what you're trying to do is pull, pull the pull. water across. Mm -hmm. And that's a sign of one of two things. Your filter is clogging the pores or you're hooked up to an ECMO circuit with too high of a negative pressure influence. We're gonna talk about that here moving forward. So I'm gonna show you something else too. If you look, you see I'm, I'm taking fluid off. Now, what would happen if I added post filter replacement? What would happen to my return pressure? And post filter replacement goes, can you zoom out just a little bit? goes right here. This is the post filter replacement uh, th uh, uh, inlet. Okay, here's where we measure our pressure. This pump down here is what's going to turn to take the fluid and pump the fluid into here at a rate that I set it at. So my return pressure should go up, but my filter pressure should not, unless this effluent pressure, I mean, the return pressure exceeds it, it should not go up significantly. Do you understand, see what I'm saying? So let's do it and see. 
So we're going to go to replacement. We're going to put the replacement at one liter. There you go. And I'm going to hit confirm all. And it's post, post filter. You see it right there. So we're going to go from a return pressure of 108 to 110. And as that starts to ramp up, it went up, but not significantly. So let's go to three liters. It may not have been enough of a, uh, a volume. So I was reading about 110, confirm all. Interesting, it did not go up at all. And it's going in right here, you can see it. But that return pressure did not go up, even though that's three liters an hour, which is about uh, what is that? That's not even three, 300 a minute, um, is equal to, that's probably 20% somewhere around there. Interesting. Almost no change at all. I think that's fascinating. So let's take off the patient fluid removal. I'm going to turn that to zero and I'm gonna turn the replacement to zero and we're gonna hook it up to the CRRT machine. But that gives you at least some idea of how this works as if it were connected to a patient. Right. Confirm all. Okay, so now it's just back to being a standard blood pump. All right, so I'm gonna pause it by just hitting stop. And usually this is a two person step, right? The nurse will, he hands you the lines and then you do what you're going to do. So I'm going to clamp over here. And I'm going to hand you the red, which is the access first. And I like the access to be the most proximal where the highest pressure is. Right here? No, there. Hit on this one? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, and can you move to your left just a little bit? You're right, I'm sorry. And show them where you're connecting it. So there you go. Can you make that big, that bottom right screen big? So what you see is Mike taking the access line red and putting it into the proximal stopcock. And I like, I like to do that because that is the point of highest pressure, okay, in the circuit itself now i'm going to hand him the return and the return is going to go in this particular case i'll take the clamp sorry is going to go into the stopcock over there the furthest one over there yeah there you go so you have it in a big bore line and then you can open the roberts clamp and you can open the stopcocks. Yep, every, open everything so that it'll go around 180 degrees. There you go. And then open the other little slide clamps. There you go. Now, now let's see what we got. So I'm going to go ahead and get this going again. Resume. Now, predicated on this new circuit, not the patient, simulated patient that we had, let's see what everything looks like. Now, remember, we're also using crystalloid fluid. We're not using blood. Blood would act differently. We all agree with that. Okay. So, you see our access pressure, even though, which is the access to, this, to, the, to the CRRT, is reading 35, even though... The and it says return disconnected. That's a very common alarm that we see because you know why it's not used to seeing a return pressure of negative 46. But we're going to talk about that. But you see, our access pressure is reading 38, 39, even though the pressure in that line is 108. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that it's an open shunt, 
it's going to the negative side of the pump. It has that reflection of that negative pressure coming back. Maybe you could point to that and sort of explain that. Right, as we see, this is the inlet to the CRT machine. It, as Joe said, does not have any resistance to its flow through the machine. So it's just like any type of a, uh, another uh, circuit, not only with a patient, but with an ECMO, but now with the CRRT. So with no resistance to it and no resistance on this end, it's a free flowing circuit in a circle. Yes, and the pressure there where the blue is, if you could point that out, go back to the big screen, yeah, right there is negative. It's minus 78. And that negative 78 is interacted with, interacting with that positive 108 because we have a straight line going through it. So the hostility of the ECMO is much less. It's mitigated because we're able to take advantage of this negative pressure along with this high positive pressure. Because if I hook this up and we turn those stopcocks differently, I have a feeling we'd get some alarms. Right. So let's try it just out of curiosity to see. Turn the stopcock so that it's only coming from the recirc to the CRRT and then from the CRRT back into the ECMO, but close the other part of the recirc line. Know what I mean? Okay, I think so. Yeah. So you want to leave, you turn, uh, turn this down a little bit. No, turn it completely uh, to, the, to, the, to the, no, you had it right, that way. Don't, no. to the, straight to the oxygenator, that way. No, to the uh, reservoir. Here, this way. No, the other way. Other way. I'm sorry. The other way. That's okay. Yeah, that way. Oh, okay. okay. And then turn the other one so that it's only going, so it's not coming down the research line. So turn it to the right. Yep. A little bit of the All way. the way. All the way. So now, let's go ahead and get it started. So we had some disruption. Now look at the pressures. In fact, return extremely positive. Now we have everything open, right? So that right. we're not we're not cheating here. Yeah, that's open. Open. That's open. The return is the blue, and it's going ah. ah so this this is going this way. This should go this way. Oh, that way. Okay. That way. All right. Okay. So let's try that again. Release clamp. Continue. Continue. Release clamp. Continue. Take a second. Okay, there you go. Now, yeah. now by taking away that advantage, look at where the pressures are now. The return pressure is minus 95. The access pressure is positive 100. The filter pressure, interestingly enough, is minus 24. And our effluent pressure is negative 59. Now, does that seem like it's good? It seems like it's good. It's not, though. But it's not. And I'll tell you why it's not. So focus in on this screen right here. And let's look at these values. This negative 57 on the effluent. And now, can you possibly just zoom over here where my clamp is on this deaeration chamber to the right just a little? And zoom a little more. Look at how low that became from where it was. Now, let me just show you what happens. And it may cause an alarm, but I want you to look at this level. Can you clearly see where that level is? Mike, can you see it on this, uh, yeah. and where my, where my yeah, clamp is? You can little, see it? The little diaphragm. Right. right now, open those stop cocks so that it's a flow through system again. And I want everyone on to watch what happens to this effluent pressure and to this. And let me know when you got it done. Is that flowing through? N no, it, it cut it off. Access negative, it's not open. Here. Okay. Probably, yeah, that looks right. Mm -hmm. This one needs to go like that. Hold back to the opposite end. Okay, yeah. I got you. There you go, no worries. So let me turn that back on and let it get itself situated okay. again and running. Now remember that effluent was reading minus 25, but now look, that effluent pressure is four. You see that? 
And if you look here, it's not as low as it was, but it is still on the low side. Now I'm gonna show you something that I think is very fascinating. Mike, what I need you to do is, on the return, that blue one, I need you to restrict it just a little bit. Turn the stopcock a little bit until I tell you that's enough. And everyone, I want you to look at this return pressure here. It's reading 70, 80, that's good, Perfect. that's good. And it'll give you a little alarm, check return, because something changed. But now that return is a little higher pressure, it's gonna go up. Now look at this. Do you see this level now with that pressure at 92? Look at the difference. So when you hook an ECMO, a, a CRRT machine to an ECMO circuit, if it has a negative pressure, go ahead and zoom out just a little bit. If this effluent pressure is negative or the return pressure is negative really is the key, then what's gonna happen is your deaeration chamber will keep getting lower and lower and lower. And you have to go in to the adjust, hit the, um, the uh, let's see, um, adjust chamber button, I'm sorry. Click this and get it to go back up. Conversely, if you hook it up to an excessively high positive pressure, over time, what will happen is that this will continue to go up and up and up into this filter here, where then your set is ruined because you can't, then you, the set stops uh, measuring pressure. Either way, it's a problem. One, you lose your set. The other, you get air in your line very hard to get out. It won't get to the patient uh, unless everything were to fail, which is unlikely, but you are really in a situation where you're not going to be able to get it reprimed you're going to end up having to change the set either way it's not positive so for the sake of this argument i just want to show them this one more time turn that stopcock towards this line when i tell you this one okay. right here just turn it that straight amount so i want everybody to look right here and look at this eat of this return pressure okay you ready ready do it now did you see it drop dramatically? And look at this level, how much it dropped. And return pressure dropping, you're gonna get that alarm. And if we leave it like this long enough, I'm gonna let it run, it will only get worse. Now, the way these pressures all interact with each other, if we look at this, our return pressure is 105. If I were to decrease my flow, and it's hooked up to a negative pressure, I'm assuming it should get worse because we don't want that pressure to be negative. Remember, when it's working in a, when it's working in a Merherker catheter, it's not, ne the return pressure is never negative. No. It's always positive. And you have to remember that. That's how these machines and technologies are made, right? So I'm gonna turn this flow, the blood flow down to 160 hit confirm all and look at how much more negative now the return pressure is because we don't have the benefit of this pump turning fast enough generating a positive pressure and what i'm trying to impart to the audience is all of these systems interact with each other. Now, all we've done is played with this machine. So now, Mike, let's do something else. I'm gonna go to a, uh, I'm gonna get these flows to where it's a little more reasonable, about 300. And if you're using CRRT on bypass, you should um, use a higher flow. Now, go ahead and open that up. Now, let's do something else. Let's affect this pressure, these pressures, and see what it does to this, okay? okay? So go ahead and put, here's your, uh, your outlet, your red is your, your patient return down here. So let's cool. partially clamp that. Okay. So right now we're at 111 line pressure, partial, it's just like a, a side bite, side bite clamp it. I'm gonna try to get the pressure up to 200. Now, let's look at what happened over here. Now we've got a pressure of 187, 
And let's see what our, I can't read that, dude. It's like it's out of focus. It's the, the pressure, the, the, that screen is out of focus. I mean, I can't even read it. The center one. It looks terrible. I can't read it. Well, zoom it in then, I guess. Let's zoom in on it a little some. Mm hmm A little more. Okay, I can read that. Okay, so look at that now. So our, our return pressure by going up because we're increasing negative pressure as well has actually, the return pressure has gone down. Do you notice that? Yeah. Now when I turn it down, you'll see that return pressure is going to go up and become more positive. You see it do it immediately. Now, if you had a patient who was hypovolemic, let's put a little bit of an occlusion now, use another clamp here, and just put it on the access side. And let's see what happens when we increase the access pressure. Oh, I'm sorry. There, now let's look. What do we see the access doing? Let me turn it up. And we're getting a set disconnection because the return pressure now is so negative. Yeah. So there you go. So anything we do here, you could go ahead and pop those off. Anything we do to any of these pressures, to any of these lines is going to have an influence because everything is connected right. to each other. That's what I'm trying to say. But in my opinion, and I don't know how you feel, but we do a lot of CRRT. In my opinion, the way we have it set up here with the recirc line going from the positive side to the negative side and those stopcocks with the access most proximal and the return most distal, for me, works the best. Now, there's one other trick you can do. So if you look here, you see the effluent pressure is only reading four. If you want to see that effluent pressure a little higher, uh, Mike, could you do me a favor and just restrict slightly, no, just with your hand, the stopcock, so that you're just taking a little bit of the surface area away. Not a whole lot, just a little bit. But let's watch this return pressure, which is reading minus four. Now it's positive 20, maybe a little bit more. There you go. So now look, you have a return pressure of 97. I'm sorry, an effluent pressure of 108, an access pressure of 74, which is unusual because it should be negative. It was in a temporary dialysis catheter, but it doesn't affect anything. Because remember what I told you, it's down here. It's before the roller pup. The part with the filter is the part that matters. So now your return pressure, your filter pressure, your effluent pressure, pressures are all in a physiologic range for the machine. You're not going to have your line coming down because you have a back pressure against it. If anything, it'll creep up, but very slowly, since that's not an excessive pressure. Your filter's going to last longer because you're now not trying to pull fluid out of it. Instead, what you're doing is keeping it positive on your effluent pressure. And so everything is going to last longer and you're going to have a more effective run. Does that make, does all of, did any of that help at all? Yeah. Good. You ready to, to, to hook up CRT to the patient? Because we're going to go after this and do that. <laughs> you mean at the hospital? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, we don't have any patients, but I'll find one. We'll, we'll get okay, one. Okay, very good. All right. So is there any questions? If there's any questions, we can go sit back down, I think. Um, well, did there anything you wanted to do? Did you want to play with anything? No, it's just real good. We've, we've tried uh, multiple combinations of where to put stopcocks, uh, Lines in with maybe three stopcocks together, uh, all kinds. But after a lot of trial and error, what Joe's talking about, this one seems to be the one that gives us the most bang for a buck and keeps the uh, different alarms from going off so much as the other orientation might. 
Yeah, I think so too. And there's a lot of people that like to use manifolds. I'm mm -hmm. not a big manifold guy. Um, and I do think that probably works okay. I know a lot of people that use it and they seem to have good success. Um, so, you know, if, if you like manifolds, um, yeah, maybe I'm not sure exactly what the issue is. What's it say? I just, I just no. it to the okay. to go off. Um, yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, then if you like use manifolds, they certainly do work. Um, and it's a way to do it. I just happen to like this. This is the way I like to do it with the caveat that if you're not careful, if you don't make sure you have good connections, if you don't make sure before you turn any stopcock that you are or take a cap off mm -hmm. or whatever it is that you're not a hundred percent sure you have it in the configuration you want it don't do it it's okay it's only reading yellow so yellow is cautionary so in the in the big green machine um, green means it's running well perfect everything's within limits yellow is cautionary and red is I need your attention right, right. with the CRT machine R2D2 whatever we used to we, we like to call it now it's a good tool works really well I think uh, but magic do we have any chat questions does anybody want to call in do we have anything that we can offer to anyone Mike just one comment on uh, Frequently, we will connect and disconnect the CRT for a lot of reasons. To change circuits, maybe a bad circuit. Is it the old circuit? Has it been in for its allotted amount of time? 72 hours usually. Uh, we'll take the patient down to surgery. We'll mm -hmm. take the patient to CT. So I think the biggest uh, um, comment I'd like to make is when you, is we're talking about when you're ready to hook things up, that it is a, I have the inlet line. It is red. It is hooking to the uh, stopcock. And we make sure that the communication between us and the nurse is absolutely understood. No guessing on this because you saw how quickly you can entrain air into that system. And, and it's dramatic. It, and you don't very want to dramatic. get that to happen. And when you have an open system like a heart-lung machine, a little easier to get it out. Yeah. But when you have a closed system like an ECMO where there's no place to put the Virtually air, impossible. Um, it's very difficult. And it's very distressful. And it's something that is avoidable mm -hmm. if you just communicate communicate, and take your time. Right. I will tell you this. This is something that I think is very important for people to understand. Although I'm a big proponent of CRRT, I think it has tremendous mm -hmm. value. It, is, it doesn't even have a battery, right? It doesn't operate on battery power. It can run for a little teeny little bit, but mm -hmm. not very long. And that's just so you can move it. And a lot of times it won't, doesn't even work. It's not designed that way. It's not like a ventilator. It's not like an ECMO. It is not considered, that's okay, Magic. It won't, it'll, it'll, it'll be all right. Um, it is not life sustaining. So when they want to hook CRRT up, there's no real emergency. Mm -hmm. Like you want to get it hooked up. It's a therapeutic modality that the patient you've deemed needs and it will be beneficial to the patient over time. Right. But it's not like you're crashing on pump or you're crashing on ECMO or you have ECPR going on or some yeah. other situation like that. This is something that's very controlled. And any time, it doesn't matter whether you're drawing a blood gas. It doesn't matter whether you're hooking CRRT up to it. It doesn't matter whether you're giving fluids. Right. Whatever the situation may be, when you are putting anything other than what is currently in the, the adding something to the ECMO circuit, your complexity, and I, I say this, I don't mean to use the word exponential too many times in the course of one particular uh, program, but it exponentially increases risk. Right. And so everything that you do is going to increase risk. Any, uh, anything over there? Anybody uh, got anything to say on, on FaceTime or, or Twitter or YouTube? Say what? The first view is fine. Said I had the same problem the la last week. Which problem? I don't know what. what the one where we where we where we sucked the thing full of air. I hope not. I hope not, my buddy from Spain. Because because if you did, you know what we're hiring here. You may have to move to the United States. We'll take you. Um, 
Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> yep, I did. Okay, good. Well, very good. All right. Well, I think, uh, have, we, have we covered everything, David? Okay, David says yes. So I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, I've got a program tomorrow. It's going to be, uh, I don't remember what it's on. What's it on? Dude, I can't remember anything anymore. I'm really getting old, dude. I'm really getting old. Me, measuring, measuring oh, great. I'm going to be talking about the trans. I have the slides done, as a matter of fact. So I'm good on that one. Um, and I had to get them. I got them from Transonic. They were kind enough to give me some <laughs> slides. So I've got some good slides for that lecture tomorrow. And then um, Dr. Duvall has two hearts tomorrow. He called me last night. I chatted with him for a little while. He can't make it, but I've got something in its place. Okay. So I'll be doing something in place of that tomorrow. So there'll be a little bit of a schedule change, but we're still going to do the same time, right? So uh, I'll see you all tomorrow at 2 o'clock. I hope this was of some value. It's very, it, it, it was a little herky-jerky. Um, I can't say I'm too, Dave, I can't tell you I'm too happy with that PTZ camera's focus on that thing. We, it, it, yeah, but it still didn't, it still didn't look that great to me. I think we might've should have used one of our other cameras and used the PTZ for something else. But, um, but anyway, so what, it's a, it's a one question. yeah. Used what? S E R A T H. No, I don't even know what it is. I'm, I'm not sure. I know what I'm not familiar with it, Jeff. Um, is that a different type of? Uh, is it a dialysis? filter? Is it a uh, machine? machine? Is it a drug? I I don't I don't know what it is. I bet hmm. you it's type of machine. It could be. I I don't. I'm not familiar with it. So. Oh, blood, filter. blood filter. Yeah, is it a, is it like a cytosorb or something like that? And if it is, there's no reason in the world why you can't do it. But I will tell you this: you don't want to have it so that the cytosorb is under gross negative pressure. Actually, that's bad for any of these things. Um, so I would avoid that. So hooking it up the way we showed you today, where you have a high positive pressure, a negative pressure, but again. If you start losing volume, you start getting chatter in your line, that becomes a problem, right? right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that you have to pay attention to. There's no perfect way other than putting a catheter in a patient, and even that's not perfect. How many times do the catheters fail? You're reversing them. You're doing their, 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 they, they're in a tortuous yeah. vessel. Um, uh, you, there's all got, kinds got of- three circuits running, a patient, an ECMO, and a CRRT. Right. So right. it is. There's a lot going on. A lot going on. A lot going on. Okay. Um, but if Jeff wants to send me some information on that, I don't know. Uh, if I had more info. Mm. It's, it's a filter. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if it's Ooh. a different machine. Jeff, I have no idea. Um, or, or, but, but I think it all works the same. It's, it's all about the pressures. And really, I don't know that I did a great job on this today. I did the best I could. But uh, uh, I, I, the whole point I was trying to teach here was that each circuit has its own circulation, its own pressure environment. But when you connect the two of them, both of them will interact with each other mm -hmm. and react to each other. So right. what you do with one is going to do something with the other. Where I think the difference is, is that the ECMO running at four liters a minute, the CRRT running at two or 300 cc's per minute, um, much smaller tubing, everything is much smaller. The pressures may be high, but it's not going to influence the ECMO nearly as much as the ECMO will influence the CRRT, mm -hmm. in my view. Yeah. And be, that's because of that reason. Yeah. Okay. David, uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Um, we're, 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 we're out. See ya.